Hi, everybody. Um, my name is James Lin. I'm an assistant professor of international studies here at the University of Washington. Uh, welcome to the Taiwan Studies program hosted event, Tigers on the Mountain, Assessing is Taiwan Chinese Today. Uh, we are very honored to have a guest speaker and the author of Is Taiwan Chinese, Professor Melissa Brown. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction to her before she starts her talk. So uh, Melissa Brown is managing editor of the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, she was on the faculty at the University of Cincinnati and Stanford University before going to the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard in 2011 and joining the HJS staff in 2014. Uh, we're also very lucky that uh, Dr. Brown is also teaching a course for us here at her alma mater uh, this quarter titled Woman, Nationalism, and Cosmopolitanism in Taiwan. And so without further ado, I would like to give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Brown and let her take it away with her talk for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. And I also want to thank the UW Taiwan Studies Program for this opportunity to talk about my work and also to work with students in the uh, class that I'm doing. I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to use. So I'm going to share my screen. PowerPoint. Um, and it's, it's, I'm, it's a real pleasure to be here. Again, thank you to James Lin and to the UN. UW Taiwan Studies Program. In 2004, when my book was published, the title was provocative, uh, but I think it's both more and less provocative now than it was then. More provocative to the PRC and perhaps to the US left and less so to Taiwan and to anyone familiar with Taiwan. Today, I want to take some time and assess the main points of the book, which points still hold, which ones I think need some revision, and talk very briefly about contexts of creation and the global political context of where things may be heading. The title of the talk comes from the saying that one mountain cannot sustain two tigers. And this uh, symbol of two tigers on a mountain references multiple things in the fraught modern history of China and Taiwan. Competing political parties, uh, referencing the Civil War and the Cold War, competition to be China, uh, competing ethnic and national identities of Chinese and Taiwanese, competing domestic regimes, PRC authoritarianism and Taiwan democracy, competing international approaches, uh, PRC's imperialism, which I will talk about later on, more as well as Taiwan's cosmopolitanism. Now implicit in the symbolism is a, a notion that somebody's going to have to get rid of one tiger, but there are other solutions. Uh, when two people born in the year of the tiger marry, it's common to gift them the painting of a tiger in order to disrupt the fate of the saying, because there are no longer two tigers on that mountain. And that's the kind of thinking I'm trying to do. Instead of making, uh, taking nationalistic statements at face value, I want to examine unquestioned beliefs and think about how to promote critical evaluation of those beliefs and of possible ways forward. A number of the book's lasting contributions, I think, are conceptual um, and so may be generalizable to other times and places. The notion of a narrative of unfolding uh, is one of those conceptual uh, contributions. Now, the concept originally came from Homi Baba's introduction to nation and narration. And it came to me via uh, Steve Harrell's work, uh, including his introduction to my edited volume, Negotiating Ethnicities in China and Taiwan. The idea of a notion of, uh, of a narrative of unfolding is that in contrast to history, which I, I'm taking to be actual events that happened in the past, 
even, even as we acknowledge that we know about the past imperfectly. A narrative of unfolding is an ideology. And, and that is, to, to paraphrase, I think, Steve's excellent de definition of it, a conscious selection of some of the available evidence about the past over other evidence. And specifically for contemporaneous political purposes. So narratives of unfolding attempt to justify the political claims of the present day in which the narratives are constructed. And they portray um, an inevitable unfolding of destiny from a primordial past uh, from antiquity uh, as though it were history. And people construct narratives of their own nation. Anthropologists sometimes talk about these as charter myths, uh, but they can also construct narratives of a hostile nation or of a disputed territory as part of one's nation and not another's. Another reason I like this phrase uh, for this concept uh, is because the metaphor also captures the point that narratives themselves change as societies and political goals and identities change. An excellent visual example of a narrative of unfolding is this uh, GIF that comes from Wikipedia, where you can see uh, with the, against the the black borders of uh, present day political uh, countries, the, the colored uh, dimensions of different polities that have ruled different parts of these land areas. And this is a narrative of unfolding. I think it, it becomes more clear in this way because why would we consider all these different polities competing and successive as the unfolding of a single nation state. And so when we're faced with this kind of a narrative of unfolding, I think it behooves us to ask, who does this narrative benefit? Now, the PRC's narrative of its own unfolding draws on the notion of a century of humiliation, Baini and Guotra. And these are certainly real historical events that they are referencing, but it's a narrative because it ignores other real events, such as the Qing invasion of Taiwan, of Yunnan, of Tibet, of Xinjiang. Um, so these are, when we start to think about all of the evidence that we have about the historical events of the past, then we look at the narratives and we have to say, well, which historic state is a present day state entitled, entitled to claim a territory from? from should, is the PRC entitled to claim territory from the Republican period, from the Qing, from the Ming, from the Yuan? Um, and, and just in terms of that, I want to remind people that the Mongol dynasty at one point reached not only the Caspian and the Black Seas, but even the Baltic. So would we want other present day states to think that they are entitled to redeem territories held by previous states? I think that if, uh, modern day France wanted to reclaim the borders of Napoleonic, uh, Napoleonic era France, there would be a lot of objections. Or if the, the UK wanted to re redeem territories under Queen Victoria, similarly, there would be objections. What past date then would be universally acceptable? Um, if we look only at present day states, um, then nothing has been ripped away from the People's Republic of China. And in fact, the PRC has invaded Tibet, Vietnam, parts of India, Nepal, international maritime areas, and is currently threatening Taiwan. So one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind as we go forward is this concept of a narrative of unfolding and, and the need to understand what the differences are between narrative and history and who narratives are benefiting.
in talking about the main findings um, that from the book and what I think should be kept and could be expanded on, I also want to point out that I'm only going to be able to mention these points briefly here. So I encourage you to ask questions later and also to read my book. Um, I think also other work that a good place to start would be the chapter in the Taiwan Studies Revisited uh, uh, volume, because that refers not only to the book, but also to subsequent work. So some of the main points that still hold are that identities are fluid uh, and changeable, that they're not fixed, um, that, they, that new identities can be authentic or become authentic. And by authentic, I mean that they motivate action, both at the individual level and collectively. Another main point is that people who share an identity are variable, not homogeneous. And this, is, this comes back to a larger point that subsequent work of mine is built on, that women matter. Women's issues were not the focus of my research for Is Taiwan Chinese? But I interviewed all mentally capable living elders in the villages where I worked, women as well as men. And that included, actually that included some who in today's world might self-select a different gender than that assigned to them at birth. That gender balance was and remains unfortunately all too rare. And I am convinced that hearing a fuller range of local level variation is what provided me many of the insights uh, that I did have and that, that those insights would have been impossible if I had been focusing just on politically important men. Another really important, crucial uh, main point that I think carries forward is that identities are formed by social experience, not culture. And this is important because narratives of unfolding claim belonging in terms of culture and ancestry. Um, and uh, culture and ancestry are sometimes taken as being equivalent, which is problematic in a different way that we can talk about uh, in the Q&A if you want. Similarly, theories of nationalism, even liberal theories, assume that ethnic belonging is based on culture. And I think that this uh, assumption is dangerous because assuming that identity is based on culture can potentially lead to violence. Uh, and it can lead even liberal theorists like David Layton to advocate autonomous regions, which really amount to segregation and sometimes even apartheid. And we know how problematic those are. Most of all, identity, assuming that identity is, is based on culture, ignores the real underlying issue of social experience and particularly of equity. Social experience builds on, but it's different from lived experience. Lived experience are the, is the actual experiences of specific individuals positions. And as such, it encompasses political economy and can be passed across generations as written laws or oral history, with galvanizing events passed down in more detail and for longer time periods. And such a galvanizing event, of course, happened in Taiwan on February 28, 1947. The 228 incident was galvanizing for everyone whose lived experience included those terrifying 1947 events. But it is also part of the social experience for younger generations in Taiwan, even those born after that date, because martial law, which was a direct result of the incident, shaped all aspects of Taiwan society for 40 years. And Keeping in mind the importance of galvanizing events um, of social experience, I think that we can also reflect somewhat on the events of today and say that tragically, I think the PRC is creating such a, a series of terrifying and galvanizing events now for Uyghurs. 
when we think about then what it is that creates collective identity, um, something that I, I, in reference to that, I think the PRC doesn't get frequently, if at all, um, what we need to look at two identities. When individuals' lived experiences are both similar to the lived experiences of other individuals, and you also get those lived experiences connected to the social experience of a labeled group as through a, a galvanizing experience. When you have this set of, uh, of, of circumstances come together, then individuals develop an authentic collective identity under that label. One implication of understanding social experience as constructing identity is the possibility that governments can engineer the identities they want. Later research that I've done uh, examined what happens when states try to engineer identity. Um, and, and this is important the screen, we tell them what they are and after a while they get used to it, was from a Han ethnologist in Beijing in the mid 90s. And it, it, while there are a few cases where it appears that the PRC has done that and that they have gotten used to it, there are globally obvious failures uh, in those attempts. So subsequent research I did focused on deliberate state events. And in looking at some of them in Taiwan, we can see that they failed. Now, again, I'm only gonna have time to briefly mention this, but the citation for the work that I did uh, in publishing on this is uh, on the screen, my piece in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute in 2010. And there I argue, contra Leo Ching's work, that the Japanese colonial government's efforts to convince Taiwanese that they were Japanese during that period failed. Um, that, that by definition, the construction of a second class citizen category meant that Taiwanese were not Japanese. And in the article, I present evidence to suggest that Taiwanese realized that. Similarly, during the martial law era, the KMT, uh, Guomindang did not convince Taiwanese that they were Chinese. And I would argue that these failures occurred because of the disparity between the narratives of unfolding that both of these states attempted to construct and the actual social experience and lived experiences of Taiwanese during those times. In other times and places where the PRC has succeeded, uh, I think it has done so because of the collaboration of local officials who have been able to bring into alignment social experience and the narrative of unfolding. And uh, we can talk more about those in the Q&A if you would like. The PRC keeps trying to shape Taiwan's identity and I think keeps failing. There have been military threats in the 1950s, in 1996, with the first, uh, Taiwan's first democratic presidential election in the 2000s uh, today. The P PRC has also courted Taiwanese capitalists and Guomindang officials, uh, politicians. Um, but because the PRC doesn't seem to understand how collective identities actually work or form, I don't think that they've been in any way successful in moving Taiwan's identity uh, in the direction that it wants. So I wanna take a, a few moments now and talk a little bit about the identities that, uh, that are in the Is Taiwan Chinese book and some of the main points there. Um, the, the villages on the screen in Southwestern Taiwan uh, were, at one time identified as Plains Aborigine villages. The, uh, this group are the ones that I worked in with these three, uh, uh, that, that I, where I'll talk about 20th century change, and these when I talk about 17th century change. And as that difference in centuries refers, um, there are more than one path to identity change, to, to crossing the border to Han, as I called it in the book. And these have very different relations to uh, the change in culture. 
with a long route, uh, allowing for a great deal of cultural change without any identity change happening, and that only coming later, and a short route having identity change after relatively little amount of uh, cultural change. Empirical factors that I found consistently uh, influenced the change and influenced which path was taken along those change uh, are demography. Uh, and here I'm thinking about the population sex ratio, uh, the relative numbers of men and women. Uh, intermarriage also matters. It introduces the means for cooperation across difference, uh, as well as introducing cultural and linguistic competence uh, to a population. And very importantly, regime change matters uh, by definition because it is a change in socio-political organization. So I wanna take just a moment and consider then the, the very different sets of regimes and their timeframes that have happened in Taiwan uh, and in China. You'll see clearly in looking at this table that there are uh, regimes such as the Deng regime that happened in Taiwan that did not at all in China. So a fourth point that influences documented identity changes is that it's important to consider changes on both sides of a border. Uh, not only a, a political border like between the PRC and Taiwan, but also ethnic borders. Um, here, Taiwan is a very uh, ethnically rich and diverse uh, population. And even the two main differences between Han um, or ethnic Chinese uh, over, uh, over um, connects much more variation within it. Um, and at various points, even there have been connections across these where Hakka, Hoklo, and Plains Austronesian peoples have been seen as by a single label during the late part of the Japanese period and the martial law period. So briefly then to talk about uh, one of the, the documented identity changes that I worked on in the book is the early 20th century process uh, that took the villagers in uh, southwestern Taiwan from the long route, uh, using a long route, from a stigmatized Plains Austronesian identity to a Hakko identity. The 1915 Japanese colonial government's banning foot binding. It was definitely colonial. It was for economic purposes, uh, targeting Hoklo and to get Hoklo Han women to be able to work in rice paddy fields, which they did not do when they had bound feet. Um, and it, it was also important because foot binding was an, uh, a particularly salient marker that marked Austronesian from Hoklo identities. After the 1915 ban, there were no longer first time brides with bound feet on the marriage market, in the Hoklo marriage market. And this allowed leeway for uh, uh, Hoklo men, poor Hoklo men who had married into the Plains Austronesian communities to seek out having a Hoklo bride for their sons. Now the, the chart here, shows the transition that goes with that. Um, with the transition to bringing in, uh, to, to intermarrying more frequently with the Hoklo, these communities also shifted from having uh, large numbers of Aksora local marriage, where a man would marry into his wife's home, uh, to following more the Han uh, pattern of women marrying to their husband's homes. So this chart shows the red or the Han, uh, and it shows uh, rates of Aksora local marriage, of men marrying into their wives' homes uh, in different cohorts over the Japanese period. And you can see that before the 1915 ban, there's a significant difference between the Austronesian communities that, that are in this uh, chart and the Han ones. 
After the, the 1915 ban, they become more similar. Uh, they adopt, these communities adopt more Han customs. And over the course of the next several decades, this Hoklo identity becomes authentic because the people in the communities are treated like other Hoklo speakers by the Japanese government uh, during the late period in World War II, by the Guomindang government treating them all as Ben uh, during the martial law period. Uh, it's not until there is another regime change with democratization that brings a narrative of unfolding, valorizing Austronesian heritage, that people in these communities asserted uh, an Austronesian identity again, and the identity shifted in the late 90s. Now, this is work that I did in Is Taiwan Chinese, but also subsequent work, and I want to acknowledge um, the intellectual engagements that have contributed to that. Um, uh, on the screen, you can see the citation for the chart, which was uh, done with Misha Lipitov and Mark Feldman, um, that was done after the household registers in those areas were computerized. I worked with hard copies during my, uh, as I was writing the book, because they hadn't been computerized yet. But I was also fortunate to be working through the original materials as Steve Harrell was working through his own materials on identity in Southwest China. And I benefited greatly from conversations with Steve about these processes. Similarly, both John Shepard and Joseph Eshrick were visiting faculty at the UW when I was a graduate student and conversations with both of them were very helpful. In fact, Joe was the first one to suggest to me that once I worked out the process of identity change in the 20th century, I could use that uh, understanding of the process to return to consider, to reconsider pre-modern periods. And uh, that was something that I did in the book where looking at Austronesian uh, adoption of a Han identity in the la latter part of the 17th century. Upon contact in the 1620s with the Dutch, uh, peoples in this area were matrilineal, uh, that agriculture was run by women, uh, there was a, an age grade system for men related to hunting and to warfare, um, but there was under Dutch uh, VOC rule, the D VOC, the um, Dutch East India Company rule, there were large amounts of Han immigration, mostly men, um, such that by 1650, I believe that um, the, uh, the estimate was 15,000 Han men uh, by 1650. Um, so it just large numbers of, of Han coming into this area. But, and because it was such a male biased uh, population, there was also a lot of intermarriage uh, with Han men and actually also European men intermarrying with Austronesian women and women of mixed ancestry. Some of the work that I did, I estimate that the mixed ancestry population at that time was between 40 and 50%. And under the Dutch, it looks like they remained as uh, with a label of Austronesian and they were allies of the Dutch. But there's also some evidence to suggest that uh, under the Zheng, that probably due to the suspicion and dis distrust of Plains Austronesians, that there was a shift in making the case that, that these populations should be seen as Han. And this is in the context where, of course, the Zheng invasion and, and seizure of southwestern Taiwan occurs with the additional immigration of some 25 to 30,000 uh, uh, people, primarily Han and primarily men. Under the Qing regime, uh, there was even more reason uh, to um, uh, uh, for people to... Um, for the mixed population to claim a Han identity. I see the slide is wrong there. It says Austronesian identity, that should say Han. Um, and, and that this process of taking on a new identity was something that 
that happened very quickly. This was a short route. There were still a lot of customs that were not uh, followed at the time. In Is Taiwan Chinese, I also looked at the change in identity of locals in Hubei in uh, the PRC. And I found a very similar process of waves of migration and intermarriage that occurred through 1949. But after 1949, because of the PRC's ethnic identification project, uh, the locals in this area were told that they're not Han. Um, and they, they do appear to have gotten used to it. Uh, and, and certainly from the 1990s, I think that there has been an authentic uh, formation of, of Tujia identity. The Tujia are one of the uh, officially recognized ethnic minorities group uh, in the PRC. Now, after examining all of those changes in detail and how they occurred and their interactions with social experience and regime changes, I came to the, the most important conclusion in the book and one that I very much think still holds, which is that Taiwanese national identity is authentic. Now, some people might question authenticity when they realize, well, or, I argue that it's a largely post-1949 formation. There are some scholars who, who date it to an earlier period. But even saying it's a post-49 formation, I still view it as an entirely authentic uh, identity um, because it rose on the basis of social experience. Um, the social experience of Hoklo and Hakka Han and of Plains Austronesians, all as Bunshangren under mainlander colonialism during martial law. And it flourished as a national identity after uh, that colonialism ended and democracy occurred. And during that flourishing period in democratization, there was a, a conscious struggle to make it deliberately a multi-ethnic identity to bring in Austronesians as, uh, as some of them would say, the real Taiwanese, zhen zhen the Taiwan um, and also to bring mainlanders in as mainlanders themselves uh, were able to travel to, to the PRC and discovered that the PRC is not their China and that their allegiance was really to Taiwan. So, so this basis in social experience, I think, makes it authentic. And, and it's a social experience within Taiwan, uh, but also in the PRC, and also, I think, increasingly a social experience internationally as well, particularly as the PRC makes the international context more and more politically charged. Um, now, a politically charged context is nothing new, uh, certainly not to my work in this book. Um, at the time that I was doing the research and the writing in the 1990s, there, was, uh, there were international politics, excuse me, about Taiwan's future and the PRC's rise. There were politics, PRC politics, about sensitive topics and indeed about any social science research in the countryside. Um, there, were, there was an anti-Taiwan bias within the U.S. Academy uh, that I think is similar to, to that in the U.S. left uh, that came about in part from the Cold War. Um, an anti-social science bias in anthropology and parts of the field of history uh, and sexism. So in that charged context, it is perhaps not so surprising that uh, some scholars have gone so far as to borrow my titles and dismiss specific arguments drawn from my work while still writing around acknowledgement. And, and here I'm talking specifically about Tonio Andrade's book, How Taiwan Became Chinese. He wrote that, or it was published in 2007, uh, following on my 1996 article on becoming Chinese and my 2004 book, Is Taiwan Chinese? And his book, How Taiwan Became Chinese, has a preface titled, Is Taiwan Chinese? The result has been that 
is Taiwan Chinese is not well cited in the history literature about Zhang's maritime empire. And that limited engagement of my work uh, has meant that I have missed out on critical evaluation of the potential generalizability of these concepts and methods. Is it due to sexism, anti-social science bias, anti-Taiwan bias? It's hard to know for certain, but it is an example of political citation. And that's a problem that contributes to the dismissal, not only of women as authors, but also I think to women as historical agents, especially if you look at that literature. Um, and even more concerning or concerning in a different way is that I think it also contributes to the dismissal of Taiwan derived perspectives on the Zheng's 17th century maritime history. So it raises a question of what responsibility do we as a scholarly community have to promoting academic honesty in terms of citations, particularly given that the current political context is no less charged. How and when should we speak out? Now it's in relation to political context that I think that is Taiwan Chinese needs the most revision. I did not foresee the PRC's imperialist actions, uh, the military threats to Taiwan, including seizure and squatting in the seas around Taiwan, buildup of military bases on China's southeast coast, constant military incursions these days into Taiwanese airspace. I still think that the Chinese Communist Party's main goal is to stay in power. But I also now, in part on the basis of other research I have done, think that the PRC is being driven very much so by the demographic impact of gender side. And by that, I mean, as other scholars have written about, the, the huge gap in the sex ratio imbalance in, in China. Uh, good conservative estimates suggest that by mid-century, by 2050, we, the, we can expect there to be 50, 5 zero, 50 million men in China of marriageable age in excess of the number of women of marriageable age. In addition to losing out on the social and economic contributions of those 50 million women, China also has to worry about so-called bachelor villages in remote rural areas. And these are very worrisome to the PRC government. And I think it's horrifyingly possible that the PRC might think that starting a war would be a good way to decrease the surplus population. That's a horrifying statement, but actually the first person who brought that to my attention and asked that of me was a Chinese citizen. I was in the PRC in 1996 when the PRC was carrying out its live ammunition war games in the Taiwan Strait because of Taiwan's first uh, democratic presidential election. And one of the farmers in the area where I was working asked me, do you think that my government is trying to start a war with the US to decrease the surplus population here? So, it is something that I think is horrifyingly possible. Um, would it work? Would it unite the Chinese people uh, against Taiwan and be willing to sacrifice the numbers of lives it would cost? I'm not so sure. Uh, as I said before, I think the PRC has failed miserably multiple times in dealing with collective identities, and it certainly underestimates the intelligence and capability of its people in rural areas. Um, so I'm not so sure that it would work. It could indeed lead to an alliance of supposedly surplus Han men with persecuted activists and ethnic groups, um, but it's still a horrifying possibility. 
Another place where, in terms of the politics that I think is Taiwan Chinese needs revision is that in 2001, I was thinking in terms of Taiwan's need to persuade the PRC to democratize or to accept Taiwan independence. And I thought that there would be leverage that Taiwan could use in allowing PRC citizens to visit Taiwan and experience how different Taiwan is because it's a maturing democracy. I still think that leverage is valid, but it takes time. And it also requires that PRC citizens have the opportunity to influence their own government, which is becoming less and less possible these days. I also thought that Taiwan's enormous economic investment in the PRC would provide more leverage than it has. So I think that these things need to be uh, need to shift our consideration. But one of the things that I also did not foresee that's more positive is Taiwan's cosmopolitanism. And this is work that I'm doing right now, uh, is looking at um, the impacts of socially, politically, and economically engaged ordinary women on Taiwanese society and how that has contributed to cosmopolitanism. Now, I should be clear that when I'm using this term cosmopolitanism, I'm thinking in terms of a social science definition that has a community basis, and that what defines a community as cosmopolitan is whether its members engage socially across diversity. That diversity is usually thought of in linguistic or ethnic or religious terms, but I would argue that it also needs to be thought of in gender terms. And if a majority of people engage across diversity in that way on a daily basis, then we can talk about it being a cosmopolitan place. I think that we're seeing Taiwan nationalism in the process of becoming cosmopolitanism. And it's a cosmopolitanism that is both local uh, and global local in the sense that uh, there are people in Taiwan working to incorporate migrant brides and migrant workers into uh, a, a more equitable status within Taiwanese society. Uh, there's also, it's also global in the uh, focus, the new southbound focus that Taiwan is taking and focusing on cosmopolitan cooperations with other Southeast Asian countries. These build on Taiwanese society's unique strengths and also requires nothing from the PRC. Moreover, I think if the PRC interferes in Taiwan's efforts to make these kinds of cosmopolitan engagements, it's only going to further the international social experience of the PRC as imperialist. Um, and that will only increase collective identity connections among Taiwan and the other countries that have been subject to such imperialist bullying. When we realize that the PRC has territorial disputes with Taiwan, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Brunei, India, Bhutan, and Nepal, and that the PRC has maritime disputes that go beyond these countries to include the US and Australia, I think that thinking about the ways in which making a step to further this uh, social experience of China as an imperialist bully ought to concern the PRC government. Now, can Taiwan's cosmopolitan engagements effectively counter the PRC's imperialism? That is something that I think only time will tell. So thank you. And I will stop my screen share now and uh, be happy to take your questions with the help of Professor Lin. Well, thank well, you so thank much, you. Uh, uh, Melissa, for a fantastic talk. Um, we have a few questions now in the comments. I would encourage everybody at this point to go ahead, if you have a question, to uh, type it into YouTube or Facebook, whichever platform you're using to view. Um, so the first question that we have uh, is actually from Steve Harrell. 
And so uh, he he said that he apologizes. He has to leave, so he won't see a response, uh, Melissa. But uh, I think it's it's a it's an interesting question. Um, so I'll ask it anyway. Uh, with regards to the point that you mentioned about the KMT not convincing Taiwanese that they were Chinese, um, he says, I certainly knew many rural Taiwanese in the 1970s who identified as Chinese, even if they didn't like the current government. Also, there are polls from Zheng Da since 1990 that show plenty of people identified as Chinese when the polling began, more than the percentage of mainlanders in the population. Of course, the convincing didn't last, but perhaps it could have if Taiwan had not democratized, if the CCP hadn't interfered, and if Taiwanese hadn't visited China starting in the late 1980s and seen what it was really like. Uh, so what are your thoughts about, <laughs> about this question? <laughs> um, so, so the first piece is that, uh, that, again, we have to remember that every population has a tremendous amount of variation. So there are going to be, to say that, when I say that the KMT didn't convince Taiwanese that they were Chinese, obviously that's not going to apply 100%. There are going to be people that that's, that who, who will have variation. But I, I would still argue that I think that that, was, that that would hold across wide numbers. And, and I think, it's very difficult to to work this out, right? Because we're we're constrained by um, the materials from the time. Of course, have biases that people were afraid to say otherwise, right? Given the the white terror that was go the white lightning that was going on, and the ways in which someone who um, who said something that the the KMT disagreed with could disappear. Um, and looking at the time now, it becomes difficult as well when because people's opinions have changed. So I, I think it it requires a lot of careful sifting through evidence to try and sort through this. but, I do think that with more sifting of that evidence and looking, weighing um, contexts of who said what, when, and and those kinds of things, I do think that that the arc of history suggests b because they did see what happened in in the PRC, and and they they did move to democratize. I, I do think that the arc of history will will uh, ultimately come down in saying that the KMT did not convince. The Taiwanese in general, um, that they were Chinese. Basically, you're saying that it's really we should take a longer term view that we're looking at this from 2021 and thinking about it from kind of a, a perspective from today. Yes. And, well, and, and you know, it, it, it's a need to do a combination of things, both to consider the moment at the time, but also to look at the at the sweep. And and I think that, um, you know, what I think was particularly important about the, the mainlanders who visited uh, the PRC and came back saying, that's not my China, um, is I think that that was mostly important to persuade mainlanders being second class citizens um, in terms of, of language and politics and, and all of those kinds of things had that cumulative effect that, that there that I don't think people bought into into that ideology, even if they felt that they had to say they did. Understood. Okay. Um, as a reminder for all of our viewers who are watching live, this is recorded and this will be uploaded on YouTube, as are all of Taiwan Studies Program's videos. So all of our videos are available online. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Could you expand on what you mean by anti-Taiwan bias in the U.S. Academy and why you think that is? In a lot of the the U.S. Academy um, is particularly in the in the social sciences and the humanities. There is a strong link. There are strong links to the U.S. political left, and from the 1960s in particular forward, there was much sympathy with the People's Republic of China and with uh, a, 
not only in terms of the historical um, reasons for why the Chinese Communist Party came to win the Civil War, but also with a communist uh, philosophical um, approach to political philosophy anyway. And, and that, the, the apologists for Chiang Kai-shek and authoritarianism, um, and that that meant that people who were left-leaning in the U.S. Academy, as many were and still are, uh, were suspicious of anyone who was looking at Taiwan because they assumed that if you were looking at or interested in or working on Taiwan, that you were uh, that you had those similar right-wing politics, um, which was very far from the case, uh, and um, it it be it, it I think still lingers today uh, in in parts of the academy and even in the larger area of China studies among people who are who are not as familiar with Taiwan and Taiwan's history. Um, and and the politics of uh, of Taiwan today. Yeah, I I would also add to this that um, we we see this. There's a, an excellent article in um, the International Journal of Taiwan Studies, I think, from maybe one of the first issues, a roundtable about the relationship between Taiwan studies and China studies. Uh, and I remember one of the responses. I believe it was from uh, Dr. Lev Nachman who wrote about how still among many of the graduate, major graduate programs that produce graduate studying uh, China and Taiwan, that many advisors are still reluctant to encourage their students to study Taiwan because they worry about their prospects in the job market. That Taiwan is simply not as hot of a topic as China is today. And so this also remains another issue that, um, uh, you know, job hiring committees and departments might prefer kind of a, a big geopolitical topic like China as opposed to Taiwan. Oh. Yes, and if I could just add to that also, I mean, that's the US, right? That's the US Academy. That's not necessarily that's true Academy. in other places. Um, uh, the UK has a vibrant Taiwan studies uh, field. And I think that it's perhaps not surprising that um, the, an island nation off a continent that influenced the whole continent should think that it might be worth taking a look at an island nation off a continent, whereas the U.S., uh, a continent that prefers to an ignore islands off its coast that it doesn't like, um, might want to ignore Taiwan. <laughs> so I think there's some some larger resonances there as well. Yeah, and I think a lot of that also we should thank the kind of institutionalization that's been done by prominent Taiwan studies scholars like David Fell, who has um, was the co-editor of your book. Um, I think what, what SOAS has done for Taiwan studies there is really tremendous. And, you know, I've, I've heard from instructors in the UK that they're still, you know, from from their own departments, there's still kind of a preference to teach China classes. Um, but SOAS has, has done a lot to make that space viable. Uh, so another question um, uh, from Professor Howard Jiang. Uh, what do you think are the most promising directions of research in the future of Taiwan studies? Will the engagement with the Chinese question change over time? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's there's a huge range of promising directions. And, and I think one of the things that's most promising about the future of Taiwan studies is that there are so many directions that are going now. I mean, my own interests in research relate to cosmopolitanism and, and those things, but um, there's there's amazing work being done on Austronesian studies, on literature, on film, on you know different eras in history, on environmental work. Um, so there's there's I, I think that's the most promising thing is that there is such a wide range of of high quality research that's going on, um, and you know engagement with the Chinese question. That's it. Well, it depends on if you mean within the field of Taiwan studies or in the broader, uh, you know, U.S. arena. I mean, that's being influenced by what's going on right now um, and and China's uh, various kinds of moves um, will will certainly make the topic heat up. Uh, I, I would prefer that wasn't the reason for heating it up. But um, but I think that it will be. 
Okay, uh, our next question. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Please elaborate on your statement that identities are not formed by culture. If culture encompasses religion, the arts and education, et cetera, don't these shape identities? So um, this, is, this is a big part of what the book was about. Um, when I went into the field uh, to, do the, to do the original research for this, like most anthropologists of the time, I assumed that identities were shaped by culture. And in fact, I wasn't actually very interested in identities. I wanted to study culture change. And so I picked communities where I knew the identity had changed based on historical records so that I could look at cultural change. And it was only when I got in and was doing the research that I discovered that, in fact, the two processes were not terribly closely related, um, that it, it really had more to do with driving how people thought of themselves in, in terms of an, a sense of ethnic belonging and identity, um, and that people use claims about culture, um, including education and religion, et cetera, um, even when that wasn't what was going on. There, there's a number of cases in the book where, where I document that identities changed without cultural change having happened at that particular moment. Um, and that, uh, that people could hold beliefs um, that something ought to be the case and yet do the opposite. Uh, I have an article um, a, a couple of articles looking at uh, the first, uh, the last woman who served as the spirit medium in one of these communities. And at the time when she turned over the role to her son and men subsequently took over the role uh, ever since, everyone that I interviewed who talked about that time period all agreed that, that they thought that a woman ought to have the role. Um, both at the time and even the elderly people thought still at, at when I interviewed decades later. But because of structural changes that happened in this change in marriage form, where women were no longer marrying within their households and bringing in a husband, they were marrying out to um, a husband's household. That was a huge factor in why this last woman spirit medium could not find another woman to train to be spirit medium after her. So yes, people claim it in terms of those things, but but really I think what's what's the driving force has to do with sociopolitical and economic changes. Yeah, and I'd, I'd really encourage, um, uh, Professor Brown's book remains one of the, I think maybe one of the only books that I've assigned in all of my classes on Taiwan. And I think that the arguments about the relationship between identity change and culture versus other factors, sociopolitical or economic, is a very powerful argument. It's one that I think is um, kind of really fundamentally gets to the point of what the social sciences studies. Uh, and so I'd really encourage anyone who, who is thinking about the, kind of the core questions, such as this one, to, to read uh, the first chapter, especially, of, of Is Taiwan Chinese? Um, Thank you. Okay, next question. Uh, how do you deal with complex Chinese, quote unquote, Chinese collective identities? One in the Chinese language that can be differentiated as Zhongguren, Huaren, Henlin. So that's sort of the point of the title, right? In English, it's Is Taiwan Chinese? Well, I had a colleague who was uh, writing um, a paper in Chinese and wanted to be able to cite it and give the Chinese title, the title in Chinese, um, and then and then parentheses the English, and asked me how to translate it. The point is, it really doesn't translate, right? Because in English, Chinese can refer either to um, national identity, Zhongguoren, or to ethnic identity, which is usually. Hanren or Huaren, or in some parts of, of the Chinese diaspora, Tangren. Um, and, and so what, what I did in the book and what I tend to do is that, that I use Han, um, even though I recognize that there are, are uh, people of that ethnic heritage who use a different term for themselves. I use Han for the ethnic category and Chinese for the national category. Um, it's not perfect, but that's, um, that, that, that helps me think through it. But it is also where a lot of the problems come in, 
in trying to deal with this issue in English um, because the English term Chinese is ambiguous as to which category is, is under discussion. Okay. Um, if I could exercise some of my own power as moderator and ask some of my own questions, um, I wanted to ask, Melissa, what do you think about the uh, kind of, I would argue that your book is, is one of the, the watershed studies of identity in Taiwan. And the Taiwan field has really come to be defined by this identity question. What do you think about the works that, that have come after yours? Um, you, you very briefly mentioned Leo Chin's work, so I'd like to hear more about your thoughts there. Um, I wonder if very specifically, you know, you argue that his notion of how identity for, is formed um, and that, you know, you're, you're questioning his, his claim that uh, Taiwanese thought of themselves as Japanese under the colonial period. I wonder if there's a difference there because of the kinds of disciplinary might explain that and that your ethnographic approach actually shows something quite different. Um, and then my other, the, the other big major work that I was thinking of is Evan Dolly's new book, uh, Becoming Taiwanese. Um, Evan Dolly said that unfortunately you couldn't make it, but he would watch the recording. Um, and what you think about the social history approach looking at urban social groups and civic and religious organizations. Oh, two big questions. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of uh, Leo Ching's book, um, so I have a whole article uh, in which I address address this, the 2010 piece in JRAI. Um, and I think, I think there's a number of things that influenced uh, uh, Leo Ching's writing, one of which is that he's coming out of the field of Japan studies. And there's a number of uh, Japan studies scholars who have put forward the idea that uh, under the Japanese empire, people could become Japanese, but as second class Japanese. And, and I disagree with that entire premise. Um, I, I think that if, if you're classifying somebody as second class anything, they're not that thing. Right. So, so in Ching's title is becoming Japanese with the Japanese in quotation mark. Um, and, and I, I think that, that it's, I, I think that that, that whole premise shifts what's going on. And, and then in addition, when, when looking at the work that he was using. Yes, I think you're right that there are some disciplinary differences in terms of his looking at literature. Um, but but I also, the, the places in the book where I was most persuaded that he was talking about people having actually become Japanese were not among the Han. It was the, the uh, Taroko, the mountain Austronesian peoples um, that he refers to as in interviews um, from, from some Japanese journalists, but then also uh, who went to uh, Yasabuni to, to demand that their ancestor spirits be returned to them. Um, I think that the mountain Austronesian peoples there may very well have come to have a Japanese identity and that, that for them that, that may indeed have, have occurred. Um, certainly those vignettes were, were persuasive to me that that may be what's going on. But, but I think that for the, the Han and for the um, Plains Austronesian peoples, many of whom had assimilated to a, to a Han identity during that time period or over the course of that time period, I, I, I really doubt that, that they had that sense. Um, and that's drawing not only on the work that I did in rural villages, but then also subsequent work where I was using the field notes from uh, Hill Gates, who generously allowed me to use them with uh, interviews that she had done with uh, some women who had uh, graduated from the third girls high school in Taipei, which was an elite Japanese language school at the time. Um, so uh, other other work, you know, I, I think that that social history is is very important. I don't think I mean, there's there's so much social history in what I do and so much anthropology and what social historians do. Um, I, I think the line between them is not always very clear. And and that's a good thing. 
Um, and and certainly, I think that that Evan Dolly's work. It, I, I've only read part of it. I haven't finished it yet. Um, I'm, I'm getting through it slowly, but not because I'm not interested in the book, but because of my other responsibilities. Um, but I'm enjoying it very much. And and I think it's it it is important to think about: is it different in an urban area? Um, and is it is does the dynamic of being in a major city uh, change things? Uh, particularly when you consider that Geelong was a place where um, uh, the, where the, I think it was the earliest place where the, the Guomindang landed, or if not one of the earliest places. So, so I mean, there, there are huge implications for, for some of that in terms of the local social experience. The other social history book that, that I'm in the process of reading and it, as well that I think is really, really important and helps us with this is Dominic Young's book, The Great Exodus. Um, which also takes a social history approach, and and again, it's there's a lot of anthropology in it, but also a um, you know it's also thoroughly founded in, in social history, and I think his examination of mainlanders uh, and their experience um, in the Great Exodus and subsequently, but also the other thing that he does is he also looks at the impact of that Exodus on. Uh, so it was an it was an in inland uh, intake to to Taiwanese um, is very important, uh, and these are some of the promising works for uh, the future of Taiwan studies. I think. Yeah, maybe if I could ask you to um, just elaborate on that very last point. What were the what are the different avenues you think in terms of exploring um, unturned stones? in this field of identity studies? Well, one thing that, that I would like to, to see more of and that I've talked about um, at, at a few points over, over my career is that I think that there needs to be more consideration of Taiwan's position in the South Pacific. Um, Taiwan was the origin point they're pretty clear now, linguistically and archaeologically, for um, the peopling of the South Pacific, um, and and that it was the from the indigenous peoples in Taiwan and the connections uh, that that then you know peoples went as far as you know not just the South Pacific but all the way. And I think that there's still a tendency to think of Taiwan studies as a subset of China studies. And, and I think that um, as Taiwan studies matures more, it, it needs to sit, yes, still have this huge overlap and, and engagement and, and conversation with China studies, but I think there also needs to be a lot more discussion with uh, the maritime world, um, not only of the 17th century, but also earlier and subsequently. Um, someone I interviewed in Taiwan, a man who had been uh, uh, conscripted to serve as a laborer during World War II, was stationed in South Pacific Islands, and he said he was absolutely fascinated because the religious practices that he found there, he felt were um, were very, very close to the ones from his home village. Uh, so there needs to be, I think, a, a lot more exploration of those kinds of connections. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm I'm also heartened by um, recently I've seen advertisements for a few uh, lecture series and events focused on transnational indigenous studies with Taiwan and other South Pacific communities, and I, I really look forward to to learning more about that. Um, we've had a few more questions rolling while while we were just talking now, so I'll go ahead and ask you. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, one question from Professor James Garing Chen. I'm teaching Taiwan history now, and I'm struck by how many of my students would emphatically answer no to is Taiwan Chinese. I'm wondering if you've noticed a change in students' perception over time. Some of that depends on what the students themselves bring to it, right? I mean, I've, I, uh, so far this seems to be the first talk I've ever given that didn't have a PRC uh, nationalist stand up and inform me that I was absolutely wrong and that it course it must be it must be part of China um, we'll see uh, <laughs> but so so yes but I think that is also part of of the climate as well right I think that that students today are more 
sensitive to issues of ethnic belonging and to issues of segregation and apartheid and to issues of imperialism. And um, so that tension, and at the same time, the PRC is giving us, giving the world stage uh, a quintessential example, uh, many quintessential examples of imperialism. So yes, I think the context, so I am heartened by the students, although uh, uh, some of the, the academy and uh, and I think the American political left still has a problem with it. Um, it the, if you look at, you know, lefty um, uh, journalism like The Nation and places like that, you still get people who are saying, you know, uh, China is is China's no threat. China doesn't, you know, spend as much on its military as the U.S. Well, maybe the figures it releases says it doesn't. But is that really true? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so, so I think there's still a presumption in many places uh, that that it ought to be, um, but not necessarily among students. And I am heartened by that. Okay, um, we have a question from uh, one of our former MA students who read "Is Taiwan Chinese?" in my class uh, together, um, and he makes a, a, a good point. I think this is an interesting question. I have a question on the PRC failure to shape collective identities. It seems to me that the PRC successfully shifted the national ideology from the far left to the far right within a few decades. The amount of support for ultra-nationalism and imperialism is horrifyingly high among people I know who live in China. Um, yes, I mean, I, th I think that's true about ultra-nationalism and imperialism and the support for that. Um, is it, is it, I mean, you can watch the slide, right? Historically, um, I, I'm I'm not sure what the question is there. Uh, I, I agree that that I think that that the support uh, in Han areas uh, for ultranationalism and imperialism is horrifyingly high, uh, and I think that there have been very deliberate um, social experiences that have been constructed by the Chinese state to do that. Um, I have been in China at the beginning of the academic year on college campuses, and the PRC requires all students before their freshman year, um, or in Shanghai, it's before their sophomore year, to spend, I forget now whether it's two weeks or three weeks, I think it's two weeks, um, basically getting uh, indoctrination uh, from the CCP about how to think. And um, I'm sure that the you know, hours long indoctrination sessions are probably uh, at least as effective, if not more so. But I personally found rather more viscerally disturbing um, that they would take hours long breaks in the afternoon and practice goose stepping around the uh, athletic fields with the uh, most promising young people getting to goose step in front with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, sub or not, um, with, with um, rifles, with automatic rifles. Um, so there's there's definitely been a concerted effort uh, to look at that, and there's there's been some research that looked at the um, the anti-Japanese riots that happened in China in uh, 2008, um, uh, and that that some researchers who were looking at this found that uh, PRC students were much more likely to have participated in the rioting than were ethnic Chinese from, uh, uh, who were overseas Chinese who were also at those universities at the time. And the researchers couldn't explain why, but I would guess that it might be related to these kinds of indoctrination method, uh, efforts. Yeah, I suppose if I could maybe ask just a quick follow-up question, whether, um, Maybe it kind of gets more to, to a question form, whether you think collective identities has a relationship with ultranationalism and what is that relationship? Well, I mean, this is partially why I'm doing the work on, on the cosmopolitanism in Taiwan, because um, collective identity certainly can go to ultranationalism. But one of the things that I think that's so amazing about uh, what's been happening in Taiwan society since the 90s is that it's not. It's not going to ultranationalism. And, and I, if you'd asked me in the 90s, I probably would have said, well, that's because of the threat from the PRC. But, but I, I think now it's more than that. I really think that, um, that 
women and the ability for uh, recognition of women and participation and agency by women in Taiwan society, not only today, but for a very long time, has made a difference in um, uh, cooperation across diversity. And I, I came, to, came back to this after doing research in the PRC about uh, rural women's labor in relation to foot binding. And in, in the interviews and the ways that, that they did, it, I, I realized that, that they weren't supposed to talk about it. They, they couldn't talk about it if they realized it for loss of face for their men. And if if and many of them didn't even realize it because they 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 thought of their labor as as helping um, rather than as actual work that they were that they should be socially credited with, and that was just in such strong contrast to what I saw in Taiwan. I mean, that's not to say there wasn't sexism in Taiwan. There certainly was, but but people talked readily about the work and the contributions that girls and women made to their households. Um, and, um, you know, and I think it's no accident that, um, you know, this is also coming out of, I, I think it's the, it's the gender side and the, the horrific demographic imbalance in the PRC, I really do think is pushing a lot of what's, what's going on as well. So there's a number of ways in which I think that, um, the, 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 the misogyny and the suppression of women and women's agency contributes to ultranationalism and that that's part of why Taiwan has been able to not go down that road. Okay, uh, we have a few more questions that came in. Um, oh, this is a good one. Uh, in regards to Austronesia as an identity categorization, some indigenous mm -hmm. artists I know reject this label and see it as politically constructed. What do you think? Huh. Well, so it, you mean in in Taiwan? Um, or, well, I'm not sure. So, so it, I guess my initial response would be any identity is politically constructed, right? It's it's socially and politically constructed. That doesn't mean it's not authentic. Um, if it corresponds to people's experience, uh, then then it can be very authentic. Um, I have debated at various points over the years, what is the proper, respectful, accurate term to use for not only indigenous people generally in Taiwan, but very specifically the indigenous peoples and their heritage in the communities where I work. Um, and, and that, you know, it, at early on, I was using Aborigine, the English term from the Alliance of Taiwan Aborigines, um, and I also uh, made an argument that it ought to be capitalized um, to make it equivalent to Han. It's the same kind of um, overarching ethnic category that also had additional um, ethnic categories uh, within it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that terms can change over time and that we have to respect the preferred terms of the peoples that it applies to. Um, it, whether or not Austronesian as a category is or will become um, authentic, I think will have more to do with whether the peoples are treated as Austronesian as a whole category. Um, to the extent that um, different indigenous groups in Taiwan are treated as distinct as distinct Austronesian groups, or I'm sorry, as distinct individual groups, as as Atayal or Amis or or different categories, then they may not find the Austronesian overarching category salient to them. Um, it, in the U.S., I think you know the term Asian American is salient because it it captures a, a social and political treatment by the US government and by many other um, Americans who lump together peoples from this incredibly diverse linguistic, cultural, and even social experience background, but because it has salience in the political world 
um, and economic world, I, I think it is it has become authentic uh, for many people, um, although that's still in transition. Um, yeah, I'm not um, sure if that answers the question, but but I, I think it relates to social experience. Yeah, the, the question asker did clarify uh, indigenous artists in Taiwan, but I think that your answer doesn't change. Yeah. Um, okay, um, another question, an interesting one as well. Uh, do you think Taiwan's emerging cosmopolitan outlooks is rooted in Li Denghui's ideas of Shenming Gong Tong Ti and Xin Taiwan Um which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Um, I mean, I, I think uh, Li Donghui was a very astute politician. Uh, and I think he captured uh, uh, sentiments that were going on within Taiwan uh, broadly. Um, and um, so I don't think those, he may have originated some the the terms for them, but not the sentiments. And so um, I, I think, this is a, a case where, you know, narratives of unfolding are effective in mobilizing a population when they are, when they closely correspond to people's social experience. Um, and I think that was a, a place where um, uh, Lee captured that. Yeah, I think the, the chicken and egg conundrum is one that I think many people think about and I think is, is very hard to answer. Um, but yeah, I would agree that Li Donghui was indeed a very astute politician and a, a very astute agriculture economist as well. Okay, yes. um, uh, a couple more questions. Uh, I like this one. This one appeals to me as a historian. It's about historiography. I'm also curious uh, how you think your work fits in with new Qing history, not just on Taiwan, but other parts of the Qing as empire or with new work that uses the model of settler colonialism. And I know that you've talked about this before, so I'm eager to hand this off to you. Okay. Um, yes. I mean, one of the things about Qing period Taiwan is that it's often categorized as um, that the ways in which uh, uh, Plains Aborigine land rights got away from uh, Austronesian peoples and, and land got... Um, taken over by Han settlers was because of the ineptitude of the, the Qing government, because they were overworked, underfunded, um, etc. Um, but John Herman did a, an article in um, HJS in 2017, I think, where he talks about Qing land grabs in southwest China. Um, and I really think that that process that he's talking about uh, is it, that that Qing era Taiwan needs to be re looked at based on the the case that he makes because I think that that there's a lot of parallels there and I'm very persuaded by by John Herman's discussion that that I think that um, the settler colonialism in the in the Qing really was a land grab and that it was something that the Qing enabled um, uh, in it because it wanted, it did want to see that happen. Um, and so uh, it's, yes, I think that there's a lot of room for, for revisiting those kinds of issues uh, and considerations. Okay. Um, we have uh, about three minutes left and we have one more question. So I think this is very good timing. Uh, how do you see Taiwan's national day from the collapse of the last Chinese dynasty? Is that a Taiwan independent day from, or independence day from China? There's a number of different ways to think about that question, right? Is, is it, um, do, do the, do people in Taiwan see it as an independence day? Um, do, is there some, overarching case in which it's an independence day. I mean, it, it, it narratives of unfolding change with the political goals and, and the, the social situations of their society. So, um, you know, I think certainly the origins of that national day 
uh, were not related to Taiwan independence in any way. Um, they, you know, it was the 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 Chiang Kai Shek's refusal to to acknowledge what had happened in the PRC. Um, but but at the same time, has it become a, a, a celebration of Taiwan's independence from China? Heading that way, possibly. Uh, you know, I mean, this is of course part of the 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 tension and the challenge with PRC's imperialism and statements that if Taiwan says it's independent, that I don't know. I mean, if Taiwan were, if there was a magic wand and and Taiwan could peacefully become the Republic of Taiwan, would it keep that as its as its national day? I, I don't know either. I mean, I think it's countries build on the contingencies of what they have. And that's the national day that was, that they inherited from, uh, from the martial rule, martial law period. Um, and so they, they do with it what they can. I, I, I won't presume to say where it's going to go. Uh, Cause I think that depends on, on other kinds of, of experiences. Okay, I think that's all of the questions. We've managed to get, to get through all of them and it's perfect timing. It's now five o'clock in Seattle um, and it's very late in the evening for you, Melissa. So I just wanna thank you one more time for taking the time to speak to us uh, about reassessing this Taiwan Chinese, for sharing your thoughts, for answering all these questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed the opportunity to do this. All right, uh, so for everybody else on the internet, um, this talk will be recorded it will be uploaded to YouTube, and thank you so much for joining this live. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.